All right, good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church. If it's your first time or first time in a long time, welcome, welcome, welcome. In the front of your pew, there should be just a connection card. If you want to fill that out, you can. If you don't want to fill it out, you don't have to, okay? Um, if you do, we will just solicit you nonstop with emails and phone calls, so no, no big deal. I'm kidding. <laughs> But we'd love to have record of your visit, get to know you a little bit, that's all. I'll send you a text message as a pastor and just get to know you a little bit. If you don't want to, that's all right. So if you have your bolts in, we got a lot going up, going on this week, going up, going on this week. Um, I'll start with our Good Friday service. If you have your bolts in, you should have one of these. You see these? These are a good reminder, but you know how they also work? as a good invite, okay? So if you guys go out to lunch after church, invite someone. There are going to be three churches that are going to be getting together um, from our community. Our church, uh, Faith Church in Linden, and then First Baptist of Holly, okay? So we're all going to come together. It's going to be here, okay? And I'm not preaching, so it should be a much shorter sermon. Um, Pastor Phil, uh, don't clap, (laughs) Dave. (laughs) Uh, uh, Pastor Phil will be speaking, uh, Pastor Daniel will be leading through communion, and I have the easy part of the benediction, so I have the easy part on Good Friday. So, but that's an invite, that's, we already have lots of families that are going to be coming and have invited families to come, so you're welcome, there's plenty, we're going to have coffee and all that out there, and it'll be a good time of fellowship, and so that's going to be this Friday. It's hard to believe that it's Easter week already, does this seem like that? Oh, there, it just, it just goes by so fast. Out on the back table, there is our family ministries table. Pastor Cody puts it together. It has all of this year's family events. We're not so much a program-centered church. We are a family-centered church. So there are yearly things Pastor Cody has mapped out that we're going to be doing. He's going to come up and give an announcement. But it also helps you with family plan and family discipleship. And then there's a small group table out on the back. We offer one of the main ministries we have in our church is our counseling ministry led by Sarah Halsey. And then we have several other uh, counselors that are involved in that ministry. And uh, so it's really encouraging. So if you know of someone that needs counseling or you need counseling after the sermon today, um, (laughs) uh, please seek seek one of our counselors out. And please understand Get rid of the stigma of counseling, okay? People are like, well, I'm not going to go because I don't want to go to counseling. I don't need counseling. Yes, you do. (laughs) We all do, okay? And uh, so it's a a great ministry, and and it's just a way we can come alongside and love on you during uh, difficult seasons of your life. We are working on our directory, Okay, our directory is a mess because of COVID. Okay, and so we're gonna. Luann is taking the Mount Everest of trying to get our directory back together. And so, if you are a member or a regular attender, if you just are here often, see Luann, and she has a little paper. And if you have a picture and email, just something that we can. If people want to get a hold of you, they can and send you cards and encouragement. Uh, that's what. Uh, she's going to be doing. We have the Genesee County Bankment, the Forgotten Man Ministries, or it's <sighs> Remembering the Forgotten is their new ministry name. I got to remember that. Remembering the Forgotten. If you'd like to go, there's still time to register. Some of you have talked to me about it today. Uh, we're up to two tables, so if you want to come to that banquet that is coming up. And then we are doing the boat and float. Please note that it is a date change. There is a date change. July 9th. Pastor Cody's been in Michigan too long, and he wants to go ice skating along the kayaks, so we're going to move it to warmer weather. <laughs> he's been in Michigan long enough. His blood's thick. He's, he's, ready, for, he's ready for the cold weather. Um, then we have family camp coming up, and then all of our small groups. Um, if you're not in a small group, that is really the heartbeat of our church. We're launching a couple new small groups after, um, and then we have our couples Bible study that is going to be coming up Uh, once a month. We're going to do a couple's night, and so that's going to be, make sure you listen for that. That's going to be coming up. So we got some exciting stuff, so we're excited to uh, gather together. So let's pray, and then we'll stand, and we'll read, and then we'll jump in. Oh, how about you come up, give your last announcement, you pray, and then read the scripture for us. Can you do that? I almost forgot. I feel like I never actually use this thing. There we go. Good morning, everybody. 
Um, I just wanted to give a quick update on how the youth conference went. I know many of you have been praying. Many of you helped sponsor a child to go. Oh, sweet. I see Josie and Paxton's family here today. Glad to see you guys. Um, they, were with the, they were one of the few students that went with us um, to the youth conference. But I uh, just want to say thank you to those who prayed. Thank you to those who helped sponsor a kid. Um, during that weekend, we took nine students with us uh, Friday and Saturday over to Westside Church in Flushing. And many youth groups got together uh, for a time of worship, time of uh, serving together, and it was great. Uh, I was able to um, meet other youth leaders for potential partnerships um, and working with their youth groups and doing different activities and service projects. So that was really cool. Um, but it was just a really profitable time. And I asked the students yesterday, would you be comfortable coming up and sharing how God worked in your life over the weekend? Because there were a few, there were many, um, that gave testimony of, of, and shared uh, what God was doing. And I just want to applaud them for the courage it takes to come forward even, and even to share uh, what's going on, how God challenged them. So while they are not up here, I have Mr. Brent with me. <laughs> while they're not up here, that's okay. I might try next year, okay? Um, but I know how it is as a, as a, as a student. So, um, but there were, it was really cool to see God working in the lives of our students. Um, everything ranging from uh, wanting to know more about baptism, uh, wanting to uh, get their life back on track. You know, the whole theme of the conference was being committed and, and being really engaged in your walk with Christ. And so that was the overall theme. And then there was one student that shared something really good, and she basically shared that I just don't want to be fake anymore. I don't want to be pretending at church, and I, that's a huge step. And so just hearing them uh, share what's on their heart was really, really cool and a blessing. And so thank you for praying for that. And I'm just going to read one verse real quick, one verse as a challenge. Whether you went to the youth conference or whether you're sitting here and I'm telling you about it, this is a, such a simple verse in terms of being committed and knowing how to follow Christ and giving your life to him. It's Matthew uh, 22 and verse 37. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great commandment. So that's, it's so simple, you know. And so I just wanted to share that verse. And at this time, I'm going to let Mr. Brent talk a little bit about our serv service project that we did with other youth groups as well. Good morning, everyone. So Denise and I have the privilege to work with uh, Pastor Cody and Ground Zero with all the teens, and it's been really a blessing to watch their growth and their excitement and enthusiasm. I would like to thank Pastor Cody for organizing and planning the event, as well as all the other events throughout the year with the teens. It's a lot of work and effort, and we appreciate them. Uh, so the, probably the highlight for me was, as Pastor Cody said, their, ex, their expression of uh, wanting to reconnect and get back on track. Uh, one, one had expressed an interest in baptism. So we need to be praying for these teens and that this is really a genuine heart, uh, uh, you know, and not just a feeling of emotion that they got at the conference. We really want to be praying for our teens because this is a really, uh, uh, it's a it's a it's a moment in their life where they can they can be really directed towards God, which is what the whole point of our group is to point them to Christ. So be praying for our teens. The service project was awesome. It was really good because they were super enthusiastic. Unlike past projects of raking leaves, building bags of uh, household goods, you know from. Uh, shampoo or shampoos and we had one bag with like shampoos and toothpaste and deodorant and soaps for like you know more like toiletry items and then we had another one with like household goods with like dish soap and laundry soap and stuff and the and the people that came in it was super cool there was two of our teens individually who took the initiative to pray with individuals and that was super encouraging because uh you know it, they're they are learning to love on others, they're learning to serve in a giving way and and have compassion for people and asking them, what can we pray for you about? And then when, when the people are like, oh, you know, my, my daughter's going through a hard time or, or my dad had a heart attack or something, specifically praying for people's needs. That's what it's all about. It's super cool to see that. So 
Uh, I was just glad to be a part of it and just, again, be praying for our teens because this is a really important mission. All right, so I think we're going to open in prayer and then scripture reading, correct? All right, so let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, what you mean to us, and the things that you've done on behalf of us. And I just pray that as we gave testimony of the youth conference and all the upcoming events that we can expect, uh, I just pray that you'll be glorified in all of it. And we just love you and praise you for who you are and what you've done. And we just ask that during this time, you would open our hearts and our minds to your word. And may you challenge us, may you shape us, may you encourage us. And we're, if we're discouraged or if we're struggling, God, I pray that you will help us to find hope in you. And I pray that if there is one that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today may be the day. And we love you. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, if you would stand with me, we'll read uh, from the scripture reading this morning. It is Psalms 116. And it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What shall I render to the Lord? For all his benefits to me, I will lift up the cup of my salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. All right, thank you, kids, and bigger kids. Denny, Lori, Lacey, thank you guys for leading us in worship. If you notice the theme in all the music this morning, you would see that it is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the cross, his blood, that leads us to surrender. It leads us to um, owe our lives to him or surrender our lives unto him. And you see, that was the common theme through the song this morning, but that's what we're going to see in our text um, as, as we work our way through the book of Romans. We are now transitioning from 11 chapters of doctrine, okay? You guys endured 11 chapters of pretty heavy doctrine, right? And so now, here is the big switch into Romans chapter 12 of how do we live now that we understand the gospel and we see how God's work and we see his attributes and we've seen his, his, all of his glory in through 11 chapters. Now we come through the last four and it is how do we then live according to these truths? How ought we to live? What should we uh, be motivated by? And I want you to see the title this morning of motivated by mercy. Okay. I want you to understand this really quick. Christianity is really built on the foundation of mercy. Do you know that? We should be people of mercy. Right? You know why? Everything we just learned, what? We couldn't save ourselves. We're not good enough. We're not able. But God, what? He saved us. Right? And that was good news. And that was the, he, he, it wasn't because he looked and he saw us and he's like, oh man, that person's a pretty good person. I'm going to... No, it was all based upon mercy. If you're saved today, it's because God showed you mercy. That's it. I mean, that, that's, that's, and so now in, in light of that mercy that we've received, now how do we live? And what you're going to see as we work our way through, we should be people of mercy. And we should be motivated by mo mercy. So I won't preach my whole message in a sentence, even though you'd like that. So let's look at your text. You ever, this is probably one of the most important questions that you ever would ask yourself, what motivates you? You ever asked yourself that? In life, what, what is it that drives you? Let me tell you something. Everybody is motivated by something. Do you agree with that? There is something that motivates you every single day. Uh, some people are motivated by their family, right? Every morning they get up. 
whether they want to or not, their kids are waking them up. You're motivated by your family, right? You got to cook, you got to clean, you got to do all, take the kids to school. You got to do the whole process. Why? Because you really want to? Now you're motivated by your kids, right? Or some people are motivated by money, right? They want to pursue careers. They want to pursue jobs. They want to climb the social ladder. They want to save for their 401ks. What is motivating them? They believe that if they can obtain this amount of money, what do they believe? Ultimately, we'll be happy, right? What, what do we realize quickly? That's really an empty pursuit of life, that uh, no matter how much money you'll have, you'll never be content. Some it's success, some it's fame. Some people are motivated by what people think of them. They're very image-oriented. Everybody is motivated in life by something. But the big question we must ask ourselves, is it the right thing that is motivating us? Okay, is it the right thing? That's a huge question. It's really the question of life. I mean, what is it that motivates you? How many of you guys remember when you were dating as couples? One? Oh, man. It must have been a forgettable experience if there's only one. I, I, I remember when I was dating my wife, I was extremely, what do you think? Motivated. Why, men, ladies, you can answer, why was I motivated when I was dating my wife? Yeah, I mean, I was Cowboy Casanova, roses in my teeth, dressing up, cologne, going on dates, romance, talking on the phone for three and a half hours, right? Anything I could do to win my wife, I was extremely motivated, do you know what happens when we get married? You know, la- ladies often get the raw end of this because they're like, their husbands are like, wow, this, he's so romantic and he's so sweet and he's he clean and he's, you know, he's just really a great guy. And then they get married and they're like, who are you, right? What do you realize? This person was very motivated. But isn't it true often our motivation or our passion wanes? Often it is true in our Christian faith, isn't it? When we first become Christians or or God saves us. I remember this early on when I was saved and, you know, you guys know my testimony. I have a pretty rough life and the way I lived and, you know, I was super passionate and everyone I met, everywhere I went, I just wanted to tell them about Jesus, right? I just wanted, uh, uh, but you know what happened over the years? That passion wanes, doesn't it? It's easy for it to just grow to commonplace. And then you wind up in just doing routines, right? And that's how religion is really created. It's just passionless people just doing the right things because they're supposed to. That sometimes describes our marriages. We just kind of coexist and do things that we ought to, but the passion is gone, right? No elbows. I see those elbows flying. But this is true in this. And I I want you to see this. We're going to look at one verse today, okay? One verse. We can make it through one verse. Some of you are impressed. One verse. Look at Paul says. Now, here, here is this huge transition, okay, from doctrine to practical living. Look what he says. I beseech you. That's an old word. What does that mean? I beseech you. I plead. I beg. I am calling you to this in a very serious tone, right? He's almost begging. What is he begging? I I beseech you, therefore, okay? So everything we just talked about for 11 chapters, he's now bringing into context. In light of all that doctrine, in light of the gospel, in light of the mercy of God, I am now pleading with you to live your life according to what? What does it say? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, these are people who have been recipients of grace, by the what? What does he plead with them according to? Yeah, he gives them the foundation. Now, it's not I'm pleading with you because, you know, God's so good and he saved you and you're an awful, horrible person. And because of that, you, you know, you have to have this guilt type relationship with God out of this duty. You know, I just got to serve God and I got to do all these things because it's the right thing to do. Is that what he says? No, he, he's calling us to be people that are, 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 have our eyes fixed on the mercy of God and the goodness of God through the gospel. He says, I'm pleading with you for your lives to be built upon the foundation of of the mercy of God. It's something that should consume us. It should be our focus. It's what should we should remind ourselves daily of the mercies that God has shown us to. So Paul's appealing. He is calling them to. And this, this doesn't just come out of nowhere. This really is showing the foundation of our faith. The roots of our faith is in the mercy of God. 
God could have chose a bunch of different topics to really lay a foundation for Christian living on. Couldn't he have? You know, he know, you know what he chose? The mercies of God. This is your motivator for the Christian life. This is what continues to have that passion or that motivation to continue to follow Jesus is this mercy of God. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it. And, and so for the next five chapters, Paul's really going to call us to a certain way of life built upon the mercies of God. This is the foundation. And, and if we miss the connection here and we miss the reasons why we should live for Jesus is the mercies of God, we miss everything. And we will wind up in being, becoming a dull and passionless religion of duty. Do you know that? Christianity should never be passionless and it never should be driven by duty or I should or because it's the right thing to do or it's morals. No, everything we do should be driven by the love and the passion for Jesus because of the mercy he's shown to us. Do you know that? Should be driven by the gospel, okay? And if we, if we, if the Christian life, if our Christian life is not motivated by mercy, all Christianity will become is a list of heavy burdens and rules and traditions to keep. That's it. We do this, we don't do that. The people that do that, they're bad. And we're good because we don't do that. We love God, right? Look at all the joy we have. (laughs) We should be people of passion, people of mercy, people of love, distinct people. This is not natural to be people of mercy. Do you know that? So let's, 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 we read a little bit of it. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Then what, here, here's the call. Here's the call. What should we do? Because of the light of mercy and all the mercy God has shown you is the work of salvation was God's work. Now, in light of all that, what should we do? That you present your, what? Bodies. Okay? And that's an interesting word and, and, uh, and someone with, in Greek would understand that and we'll talk about it. But it's to present your bodies, okay, as a living sacrifice, the opposite of dead. This is a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So I want you to see this, the first point I want you to see is that all Christian living is, should be coming out of the mercy that we received in Christ. This word therefore links all of the chapters of the gospel and says Christians should be continually motivated by the gospel. And there's two really things that we see. We, we talked about this in Romans 11 just for context. We saw that all things were created by him, for him, and through him in Romans chapter 11. And they were all created for what purpose? What was the whole purpose of God creating everything? You ever wondered that? Why did God create everything? Why couldn't he just leave us be? You ever asked yourself that? Why did he have to create everything? He created everything for one purpose and one pers- purpose only. What was that? His glory. It's not our happiness. It's not our joy. It's not good circumstances or bad circumstances. It's not so God can make us rich, wealthy, and healthy. No, God created us for one purpose. All of creation is for one purpose. is to bring forth glory to God, okay? But there's another sense, and this is the sense that it's referring to. This refers back to everything Paul has said, but it refers back to our state before Christ. If you think back to, with me to Romans 3, it, what does it say? There is none righteous. There's no one that's good. There's no one that seeks after God. There's no one that understands. We've all gone our own way. There was, so what he's saying, there's none of us in our natural state without Jesus that's going to seek after God, that's going to want God, that's going to pursue after God. But the mercies of God is rooted in that God was the one who pursued us. Aren't you thankful for that? Because without God pursuing me or you, none of us would come to know him as Savior. But it was, be- and did, did, did we deserve him to pursue after us? No. No, it's purely his mercy that God reached down and he pursued after us and he grabbed us, he carried us, he saved us, and he will ultimately lead us to glory. It is rooted in the, the, the richness of his mercy. And because of our condition without Christ, none of us can claim that God owes us anything. He doesn't owe us salvation. He doesn't owe us the blessings that he does give us. He doesn't owe us anything. Yet he gives us everything. You know what that is? Mercy. Mercy. Abundant mercy. Abundant mercy. 
And so based upon this mercy, in the same vein, Paul says, I'm urging you. And this is an interesting Greek word. It's actually, it's two words. It's meaning to call alongside. And it's the same phrase, if you remember with me back in Romans chapter 8. Remember when we talked about that little phrase where it's like the, the Spirit of God helps us? And how that's not really a good translation of that word. It's literally the Holy Spirit will come, grab us, pick us up, and carry us. This is that same Greek word that is being used here, and it's for the Holy Spirit who is carrying along to help us. And so what he's telling us here with this this Greek phrase, he's literally telling us that this is the direction that the Holy Spirit is carrying us. So if you are the brethren, and you've just heard Paul's uh, proclamation of the gospel for 11 chapters, he says, therefore I'm urging you, meaning he's saying the Holy Spirit is bringing you to this place based upon the mercies of God, that you would present yourself as a total and complete sacrifice unto God. Do you want to know what God's will for every Christian's life is? Everyone, not some, not a couple, all. And where his spirit is leading every one of us that are believers, it is to to complete and total commitment to Christ. If you want to know where God's spirit is and where he's leading us, it is to complete and total surrender to Jesus. It's his will. It's not that hard. So if you want to follow God, and if you want to follow Jesus, do you know where it's going to take you? And didn't Jesus say this? I would, in Revelation, what did he say? I would rather you be cold than lukewarm. Right? This, and he says, if you're not for me, you're against me. Is, was there ever any middle ground with Jesus? No. The rich young ruler, what'd he say? He says, you know, let me first go here. Let me first go be with my family. Let me first go bury. And he says, he says, if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me, the kingdom of God. And following Jesus is not some passive American religion that we have. No, 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 my friends. Following Jesus is everything. It's our whole life's purpose everything. That's why he created us to. So this is where he says the Holy Spirit is leading us. So if we're wanting to following God, we must understand where his spirit is leading us. And this is where he wants all believers is to total surrender to Jesus. And our motive is very crucial in this. And so let me, let me see. And some people, and I want you to understand this, because God does not want you to serve him out of guilt. Do you know that? You don't have to. It's not some guilt thing we have to do. It's not some right thing we have to do. Listen to me. Don't serve God because you have to or you should or you were raised to. Your heart for serving God is because you are recipients of his grace and because you are great recipients of this grace and mercy, you want to follow God. There's a huge difference between those two things. There's an old commentator, Everett Harrison. He says this, He says, whereas the heathen are prone to sacrifice in order to obtain favor from God, Christian faith teaches that divine mercy provides the basis for living sacrifices. The great motive for giving yourself wholly over to God is that you have experienced his great mercy in Christ. And he asks this, have you experienced his mercy by calling on him to save you? Without that, all service to God is just moralism. Moralism based upon wrong motives. The only right motive is the mercies of God. Secondly, I want you to see this. He calls us, the basic commitment for Christian living is, is to give ourselves over as our bodies. Look what it says. Um, I want you to see this. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. What is he contrasting here? What was the common sacrifice of this culture? What, were, what would Jews often do in their sacrifice in the temples? It was a dead sacrifice. Right? And often in, in, in Greek or Roman culture, they would sacrifice to their pagan gods as a dead sacrifice. So what he is saying is a radical cultural 
contrasting statement that our sacrifice isn't something that is dead, but is something that is living, and that something that is living is what? Us, our bodies. What we offer God is, guess what? Ours, ourselves. This is how we follow God. We offer ourselves to follow him. So if you ask God, what do you think he wants from you? Do you know what he wants? You. All of you. Not some, not a little bit, not most, not 90%. All. And so, the, and, and this is what he uses this illustration um, of animal sacrifices. Paul's appeal here is not to uh, just offer ourselves as dead sacrifices, but as living sacrifices. It means offering everything that we have unto the Lord. Everything that we have. But I want you to understand this. This is a choice that you and I have to make. This is where his spirit's leading us. This is where God's, God is leading us to this decision. But ultimately, you and I will come to a place in our lives where we have to decide if we're going to follow God or we're not. Old quote says this, If God is good and if he loves me and if he knows what is best for me, he will only ask me to do what is best for me. Would we not be stupid not to entrust our entire lives to that sort of God? But often we, as God's creatures, do you know what we're driven, driven by? I always say this, there's two types of people. There's people that are driven by pleasure and people that are driven by purpose. Right? What are pleasure-driven people motivated by? Right? What, what makes me happy today? What's good for me now? We live for the moment. We live for the day. We live for what's good for me, what's best for me. I'm going to pursue my heart. I'm going to pursue my dreams. I'm going to pursue everything that is good for me. Do you know Christianity is the exact opposite of that philosophy? That's pleasure-driven. That's people that are self-focused. Jesus came to destroy all that, and he says, we need to be people that are purpose Driven people that have chosen to live for the will of God for their lives in total and complete surrender. And it's interesting, this present, following God is not some decision that you made years and years and years ago. Do you know that? Do you know when this decision to follow God takes place? I, I hear it all the time, Pastor, well, I made a decision back in the 1970s to follow God. Good. The question is, are you still making decisions today to follow God? This, is a, this Greek word is an aortist tense. It talks about an action, but this action that is continually happening in the present. So it's not just enough that we said one time in my life, I made a decision or I made a commitment to follow Jesus. So many people that I meet, that, that's their testimony. They're like, you know, I made a decision long, long, long time ago that I'm going to follow Jesus. Do you know that that decision doesn't just happen once, one day, way back when, that that decision needs to continually happen today and tomorrow and next day and next week and next month and next year? Following Jesus isn't just something that we did way back when. It is something that we should be doing now, actively and presently. How many of you feel like following Jesus every single day of your life? Huh? Anyone? Anyone? You just wake up and you're singing all, all the worship songs and you're just praising God every single day. The kids are fighting. The kids are acting crazy, running all over the house, and you're just praising God for it all. No. This is a deliberate act of our will that we must choose to follow Jesus every single day. And he uses this word body. Why does he use the word body? He could have said your heart. He could have said your eyes. This is in reference to the entire person. What does your body consist of? Your hands, right? Your feet, your eyes, your ears, your mouth. You know what he's saying? Your entire being is an act to follow Jesus. What should our hands be used for? right? Feeding the poor, caring for the sick, elderly, 
The widows, right? What our feet, what should our feet be used for? Helping people. What should our mouth be used for? Building people up, sharing the gospel, right? Talking about Jesus, encouraging other people. What should our ears be used for? You see what I mean? He's using the entire person because we are so prone to compartmentalize our faith, to make Christianity something about something that we attend in a building that we sit in. When he's saying the real Christianity doesn't just, it's not some religious activity you do. It's every fiber of your being of who you are. It's everything that we are. And this commitment is ongoing and it involves our body. Our minds, our eyes, our ears, our tongues, our hands, our entire being should be given over unto the Lord. And he uses this phrase, this is a reasonable act of service. What is he, that sounds like a lot, right? It sounds like God's asking for a lot. He wants our entire being. But Paul ends this and he says, this is just a reasonable act of service. Look what he says. At the end of verse number one, he goes, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That Greek word is where we would get our English word, logic. This is your logical choice. He, and this is the word that he only uses here and one other time in 1 Peter 2, and it's the word where we get logic or ration. And so it's in light of what God has done for us in his mercy, it is reasonable or logical that we should give ourselves over totally to him. Paul is applying this word for religious worship to our everyday lives. When you think of worshiping God, especially in American culture, what do we think of? You know, we often are programmed to think when we think, well, I'm going to worship. What do we, what do we often think? Yeah, I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to sing, right? You know, that's like the direct opposite of what he's saying. He's literally saying that this, this Christian life, it's not, it's not some service. It's not some service time. It's not some building that you attend. It is literally our entire lives, every aspect of us, being handed over to God every single day of our lives, it's vastly different than what we see in American culture of just attend this building, sit with a group of people, and find one you like, and that's worship. It's not worship. Listen, I'm, I'm going to be blunt. If God doesn't have every piece of your heart and life, you're not worshiping him. That's, what he, that's literally what he's saying. Paul renders this to everyday life. Uh, and you see that in Hebrews 12, 28. But think about this. Think about this. Do you remember the story, the, the parable that Jesus used of the Levite and the priest and the, and the man that was found on the side of the road? Do you guys remember that story? What were these, this Levite and this priest, what were they on their way to go do? Do you remember? They had to serve in the temple, right? Do you think they thought they were going to lead worship, read the scriptures, go to the temple, offer sacrifices, right? We're, we're serving God, right? And what did they do when someone that was in need of mercy and compassion was actually presented to them in their life? What did they do? They walked around. They passed by. Why? They were so consumed with going to the temple. They were so consumed with their liturgy. They were so consumed with their readings and all of the temple, the things that went on in the temple. They were so consumed with that. They were not people of compassion. And let me tell you something. They missed the entire thing. Our lives every single day should be motivated by mercy. Our lives shall, should be lived as worship, not worship as something that we attend. Does that make sense? So Paul is really applying this word to religious worship to something that is happening in our everyday life. Hebrews 13 reads this. He says, Through him then let us continually offer up sacrifice of praise, mouth, 
that is the fruit of our lips to give thanks and, and to not neglect doing good and sharing. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. What sacrifices does God want from us? Acts of mercy. Listen, listen. And we're going to look through the rest of the chapter. Worship, when it's lived out, it is evidenced. People that really worship God. You know, it's not going to be people that preach. I can preach all the time and not really worship God in my life. Do you know that? Lori can get up here and sing. Denny can play and do all these things and not ever really worship God. Do you know that? You know, you can come in here and sit down and be part of every single little thing that we do in this church. You know that, and not really worship God. You know that. You can sit here every single Sunday till the Lord comes and not really worship God, though you sing every song. Worship is a life that is displayed through acts of mercy and love because those are are the hearts that are motivated by mercy. Look how it's evidenced. Look at all through this chapter. We're going to highlight this more throughout the the next upcoming weeks, but look at with me in verse number 8, the end of verse number 8. How do we know that this is correct? Look with me in verse number 8. Look what he says. He who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberty, he who leads with diligence, he who what? Shows mercy with what? Cheerfulness. This is what Christian worship looks like. It is people who show mercy with cheerfulness. Now look at this next call to worship. What does worship look like? Verse number nine. Let your love be... What does it say? You want to worship God? Let your love be genuine and sincere. Let your love be without hypocrisy. You want to worship God? You want to know what it looks like? Loving people. What kind of people? No, really. We we Christians, we, we don't love like God loves. God loves all people. Do you agree with that? Should we? Yes. Worship is loving other people. That's an act of worship. Verse number 13, look what it says. Look what it says. Distributing to the what? Give all your money to the church. That's 10%. Here it is. That's where I'm worshiping God. Oh, you know me better than that. What does it say? Distributing to the what? Needs. It's not some bucket list we do. It's as a radical life of what? Generosity. To build the hierarchy of the church? No. To give it to people in need. You ever notice through the New Testament, Jesus was always calling his followers to sell all that they had and give it away to the poor? It's quiet in here. Feed the hungry, give your money away, render unto Caesars what is Caesars, be radical in your generosity. Why? Because followers of Jesus were not motivated by money. We're motivated by mercy in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. You want to be happy? Give your money away. Quit counting it and scrolling at your 401k. Give it away. You want to see where your heart is? Try giving your money away. Try giving it to poor people. You'll see where your heart is. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Give your money away. Verse 14, what it says, what should we do? Bless those who what? How how limited is our worship here? You're to love people who hate you, love your enemies, and do good to those who persecute you, right? That's worship. 
See, what we've done is we've reduced worship down to some service that we attend. Why have we done that? Because we don't want it to penetrate our daily comfortable lives. But my friends, I'm here to tell you that this is not worship. Living the gospel out is worship. We're here to weep with those who weep. Look at with me in verse 15. Here is the heart of mercy, or the heart of worship. What does weeping with those who weep mean? You know some of the people that weep the most in our church? Do you know who they are? Our widows. People who are alone. They suffer deep grief. You know one of the greatest ways we can help people? Is to come alongside them and sit next to them and just be there with them. Do you know that? Let's weep with those who weep. Those that are hurting. Verse number 16, look at the end of it. Here's the call of worship. Associate yourself with who? Verse number 16, the end of verse number 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your high things, your mind on high things, but associate with who? The lowly. There should be no preferential treatment in our churches. We should be people known to associate with the lowly, the humble, the poor. That's worship. Verse number 17, what else does it look like? Verse number 17, what does it say? Repay no one evil for what? Should we be people of forgiveness because we've been forgiven? We should hold grudges and pray for fire to come down from heaven and consume people who've wronged us. Do you want to be free in this life? Do you want to be free? Let me help you some something in life. You need to forgive all the time. Don't hold grudges. Don't hold bitterness in your heart. You will be miserable. You know what you should do? Forgive. Forgive, forgive. And then when you think, how many times should I forgive? Let me tell you something. Forgive and do it seven times, 77. Keep on forgiving people. We should be people that offer forgiveness to everybody. Why? Why, why, why? It's not fair. You don't know what they did to me. You know why? We show forgiveness to all people. Because God's been merciful to us and he's offered us forgiveness, right? Forgive people. Don't avenge yourselves. Let me help you. Let go of your past. Some of you hold on to your past and what people have done to you. And you think about it every day. You lay your head down at night. You wake up in the morning. You think about it. It consumes you. You're not free. My friends, worship will set you free. Repay no one for evil for evil. Don't even think about avenging yourself. Let go of your past and all the wrongs people have ever done to you. Let it go. Let it go. Verse 20. I love this. What does it say? Here's worship. I love this. This is powerful. This is, if your enemy is hungry, it's not just forgive and let go and just don't talk to them. You know what it says? If that person who has wronged you, those hurt you, that is, that is persecuted, has done evil towards you, that, would that classify maybe, maybe someone is your enemy? You know what you should do to your enemy? If they're hungry, what should you do? Feed them. Invite them over for dinner. If they're thirsty, what should you do? Give them a drink. For in doing this, what will you do? It's not like God's not saying, you really want to get back at them? Yeah, love them. Like in this manipulative, passive-aggressive way. That's not what he's indicating here. No. What he's really indicating 
is you've been loved much. You've been forgiven much. Love and mercy conquer everything. Do you know that? Do you think love covers a multitude of sins? My friends, if we want to worship God, we have to stop putting God in some box that we do on Sunday mornings. Worshiping God is something that we live every day of our lives. And how is it lived out? We are people of mercy. We've received mercy. We give mercy. My friends, that is the sacrifices that, God, that is pleasing to God. God is not pleased when we attend services. God is not pleased when we sing. God is not just pleased when we preach. Those are good things. But above all that, the sacrifices that God accept are a broken and humble spirit and a heart that is filled with mercy motivated by the mercies of God. So this is the call that Paul leads us to. And we're going to spend a couple weeks going through how this is lived out. And we're going to talk in the coming weeks about submitting to our government. You guys ready for that one? Well, my friends, I want you to, I want you to, I want you to, I want to close here, okay? Let us be people. I want you to ask yourself this. The one question is the motivation of my life the one thing that I get up for, the one thing that maintains my joy, the one thing that maintains my hope, the thing I continue to remind myself of, the thing I look to, is is it the mercy of God that he's shown to me? If not, my friends, you will not forgive. You will be full of bitterness and spite and vengeance and religion will, uh, Christianity just become this religion and it's something you do. It's... uh, What he calls us to do is be a people that are consumed with the mercy that God's shown to us and then we display that in our lives. That's what he calls us to do, to be people that are motivated by mercy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, it is challenging. Lord, Lord, we're so prone to put ourselves first and to think of ourselves. And Lord, you call us to live a life that is contrary to everything that just we know. But God, we have seen your rich mercy. And Lord, that we didn't deserve your love. We couldn't earn your love. You gave it to us freely through your son. And we've obtained mercy. But God, let us not just forget about some decision that we made a long time ago. God, I pray that you would renew in us a heart for the gospel. Lord, a heart that would see ourselves for what we are, but see your mercy and your grace for what it is. And God, it would fill our hearts with passion, with worship, with love that is lived out every single day. Lord, I pray that you would change every one of our hearts in here. And Lord, our hearts would be that we'd be people that are filled with mercy, that we display mercy one to another and to the world around us, that we'd be people of mercy. God, only now you can work and you can change us. God, I pray that no one would harden their hearts to these truths. But God, that these truths would soften us and that we would know that we can come to you and ask you to rekindle this passion in our hearts for you authentically. And Lord, that we can be your followers and that there's freedom here in a life of worship. So God, I pray right now that you would break chains or a bitterness of unforgiveness Lord, of people that motivated by money and all the wrong things, that you would mo- draw them to yourself in the gospel, that they would see your goodness, and that it would bring them close to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Thank you for joining us this morning. I would encourage you to find somebody that you may not know well, that you don't talk to regularly, invite them to your home, invite them to lunch, spend time together, right? Encourage one another, be with one another on the Lord's day, okay? That's my challenge to you. Let's display this mutual love for one another as you go this week. Remember, Friday is our Good Friday service at 6 p.m. here, and we'll be together with several other churches. You're dismissed. Have a great week.